Hi, I'm Bob Hershey with the CCA. Welcome to the International Association of Woodcarvers. All right, guys, welcome this afternoon to the International Association of Woodcarvers. It's a little bit after 3 p.m. on the 22nd of October. I appreciate your all's patience as we work through some technical difficulties today. Uh, today on our meeting, we have a special guest with us. We got Mr. Bob Hershey coming to us uh, from Pennsylvania. Bob's a CCA member. Uh, he's going to be doing a demonstration for us on cottonwood bark and how he carves cottonwood bark houses. Uh, but before we get started with him, I want to tell you a little bit about an auction that we're going to be doing in the chat in the meeting today. Uh, when we were out in Colorado Springs at the first annual CCA uh, Carving the Rockies show, um, Rich Smithson from Helvy Knives um, had Bob sign a signature series knife uh, of Bob Hershey's. Um, that he's donated to this group and we're going to be doing an auction, a live auction in the chat today for this knife. So it's again, it's a Bob Hershey signature series knife that has his autograph on the other side. And um, again, Rich and Holly Smithson donated this to our group so that we can raise funds. All the funds or proceeds will go towards continuing these Zoom meetings. Again, every month we uh, have to pay for the subscription to be able to continue to have these meetings. So if you're interested in bidding in this knife, we're going to go ahead and start that in the chat. Uh, the bids will go throughout the meeting, so it'll last until the end of the meeting. At uh, some point, I'll carve or I'll call the uh, the auction, and the winning bidder needs to stay in. Uh, we accept payment by PayPal, uh, and I'll get your information so I can ship the knife out to you. And again, all the proceeds will go towards continuing to run these Zoom meetings. Uh, so if you're interested in the knife, again, a uh, healthy knife. Signed by Bob Hershey. It's a Bob Hershey Signature Series knife. Uh, it's a great knife. It's got the finger grooves in the bottom. It's uh, got the number on the bottom. Um, this is number 173. And again, it's a Bob Hershey CCA Signature Series knife. So if you're interested in that, uh, go ahead and start placing your bids in the chat. I uh, wanted to tell you a little bit about some workshops that uh, are available out there. Uh, they're going ahead and taking signups for these. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, signing up for a class, you need to reach out to the instructor. Uh, Dave Stetson's going to be having a Santa class that starts November the 5th. Uh, Janet Cordell is going to have a Nelly Daw class that starts November the 11th. Uh, again, Bob Hershey, who's on with us today, and he may talk a little bit about his class. Uh, he's got a Raccoon Santa class that's starting on December the 3rd. And then Ryan Olson, who's going to be presenting for us next month, uh, is going to have a flat plane class starting in January on January the 14th. Uh, you can find all of this information out on uh, Wood Carving Academy's website. So if you want to go out and check that out, you can look at it. Uh, but contact the instructor so you can get signed up for those class classes. Uh, some of them require a rough out, so you may have to purchase a rough out for the class. Uh, so it's better to go ahead and sign up early so that you can get the uh, materials that you need to be able to take the class. Um, at the end of the meeting, I'll talk about upcoming presenters. At this time, we want to allow uh, time for Bob Hershey to go ahead and get into his presentation. He's got quite a bit of information he's going to be sharing with us and doing a little bit of a demo uh, on how he carves cottonwood bark. So, Bob, I just want to say thanks for coming on today. Uh, thanks for your willingness to share with us. Uh, and we'll go ahead and turn the meeting over to you. OK, thanks a lot for having me on. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. I'm going to do a little self-promoting here first on some items. Uh, Blake talked about the, uh, uh, the raccoon, Santa raccoon class, Rudy. And uh, this is the class, and you can uh, find all the information you need about this on the Wood Carving Academy. Go to the woodcarvingacademy.com uh, uh, and uh, look under workshops, and you can find all you need. Now, uh, we're going to just do the raccoon and the present, the gift that he's sitting on. Uh, that we will touch on briefly uh, as time allows at the end of the class, but we're not going to carve that uh, per se in the class. Um, I'll, I'll explain how I do it and uh, all that, but uh, uh, and that'll uh, that's uh, you would have to supply your own wood if you want to do that. Uh, but the rough out uh, comes with the class. Also, while I'm on the wood carving academy, uh, some of you have seen my. Uh, Ronnie and Ruthie, the chain pool frogs, which uh, I did a little class on out at the uh, CCA event in Colorado Springs. 
the videos for this, including the painting videos, are on the uh, academy now. So if anybody's interested, uh, you can uh, check it out there. Uh, also, I'd like to say uh, some of you that are on here probably uh, are familiar with uh, the last winter or two when we had the COVID situation. Um, the Lancaster County Woodcarvers had a Zoom meeting, and we're going to start that back up again. It's the first uh, Tuesday of each month, so uh, next uh, month it'll be November 1st, and we're going to see how it goes. We had good participation with it throughout the, uh, uh, the COVID, and there's been some suggestion that we should do it again over the winter, so we're going to try it. So anybody that's on here is more than welcome to join us. Uh, we, we go around the room, everybody that shows up and you can uh, talk about what you're carving, ask any questions or just observe. You don't have to uh, participate if you just wanna observe. And uh, we've had some pretty interesting discussions on there in the past. So we're hoping to do that again. And if anybody's interested in joining us, it's at seven o'clock, November 1st. And the Zoom meeting number is 417-966-8402. And while I'm promoting here, uh, next weekend, if anybody is in the area at uh, East Berlin at the Conowago Club, their, uh, their uh, show will be uh, so if anybody's interested in that, if you're in the area, it's a real nice show. You might want to take that in. And I'm also going to promote our Lancaster County Wood Carvers Club show next March 11th and 12th. And Kevin Applegate will be our feature carver. And uh, anybody want more interest, want more information about that, uh, you can email me or call me, let me know. So... I think that's all my promoting and we can get on. Now, a lot of you uh, are uh, familiar with me as a caricature carver and mostly an animal caricature carver, but uh, I'm gonna switch gears on you a little here today and uh, show you a little bit how I do my bark houses. Uh, I used to carve a lot of them in the past. I haven't done too many of them recently and uh, they're a lot of fun. I kind of got started out, I was carving bark houses, uh, typical bark houses, and uh, I got bored with them really quick. So I started to uh, add a theme. And the first one I did was the Halloween. And uh, I, I think the bark kind of lends itself real nicely to uh, the eerie look of a Halloween piece. So uh, I primarily did Halloween houses, and um, I'll just show you a few of those. Uh, and I, I, I don't have a lot of these around anymore. Um, I went to, uh, <laughs> I don't know what I did with them all to tell you the truth. I don't know whether I sold them, gave them away, threw them away or lost them. But uh, I have some real old ones I did 10 years ago. Uh, ones I did recently, I don't have many of them around, but uh, this is basically what I do. Uh, it's 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 a re, it's a, a house, it's a cottage, a haunted house, if you will. And then I do a little relief scene in the back. And I like to put a lot of witches flying through the moon. Sometimes I add bats. Uh, you can do a lot of different things. Uh, I often, when I taught classes in this, I used to tell people that. If you want to get ideas to put on your uh, Halloween bark house, just take a walk through your own neighborhood, uh, you know, during the season, and you'll get more ideas than you can uh, uh, than you can do. And um, one of the things I've done with my bark houses, I I never got that big a thrill out of opening the windows up and putting a light in and all that. Uh, it just wasn't my thing. Uh, I found that um, when I did that, I would usually put a light in it, set it up on the fireplace mantle for an evening, 
forget that I, I look over at it one time and go, hey, that's pretty cool. And I'd forget that it was there. And uh, a couple of days later, I'd realize I'd never turned the battery off and uh, or the light off and the battery would be dead and that'd be the end of that. So I started, uh, I just paint my windows, especially in these Halloween houses and I'll paint eyes in the window, um, cobwebs. Uh, of course, in this house that was uh, featured in the advertisement for the event today, uh, I painted some zombie hands and uh, I just Googled zombie hands and found these on the internet. And, uh, and uh, I kind of went with that. And uh, so here I painted the eyes and the hands just to give you some ideas. Um, it, it, it's just, I think it looks just as good to me as opening the windows up uh, the traditional way. Uh, I've done plenty of that too. I'll just show you this one real quick. It's a very old one I did, but it has a lot of uh, cobwebs in the windows. Has a witch up top there and a bat, and uh, and here we have a spider in the window. Um, and so then um, I started doing other theme houses. And Christmas was next. And this is my big Christmas house, which I probably can't get on the whole thing here. It's all one piece of bark, just a big piece. And uh, this one I actually did, I don't know why, but I went up in underneath and opened it up so that these windows are open so you could light it up, which I don't know that I ever did. So I don't even know why I opened it all up, but I did. Uh, and then here are these top windows. I just painted them and painted the candles in. And uh, so I've done a lot of these Christmas houses, uh, this Santa on the sleigh. Uh, there again, I just got that off of Google Images and uh, I've used that pretty many times. Uh, it's a lot of work to do that, but uh, it's kind of fun. And uh, just show you briefly, I don't have many Christmas, I don't have many of these houses around at all anymore. But here's one where I have uh, Santa coming out of the chimney and um, have snow on it and whatnot. And I also, uh, another theme house that I did was, uh, excuse me here a little bit, I gotta reach for some things. I did the, um, these surf shacks, I had a lot of fun with these. And, uh, you know, th th these are th these are the fun carvings. They're not, this isn't serious carving. I mean, you know, you just get a piece of bark, 10 or 15, 20 bucks, and you, you, you carve away. It's not, there, there's no great inspiration or anything, or you don't see things in the woods. You just carve away and have fun with it. You relax and you carve. And, uh, you know, if it, you know, if it doesn't work out, you didn't lose much. And uh, I think if you take that attitude about this, you'll have a lot of fun with it. Uh, on this one, uh, the palm tree, I created a lot of negative space underneath the palm tree there. Of course, I put the surfboard on here and uh, this is the same surfboard and the same design. Some of you that might've taken my frog uh, Fearless Freddy class, that's the surfboard I like to use. And then of course, uh, there's a sign for sale, beer, butts, and bait. Just cute little things like that. And on this, uh, this surf shack, which I, by the way, painted a gut awful color. It's enough to scare you. Uh, but on this one, the palm tree, I didn't do the negative space. I just kept the big hunk of bark there and created a little depth uh, with my V tools and knife to create the shadows for the palm tree. Um, I've done a, quite a few other theme houses. I, I, I did a class up in New England one time and we did a, a lobster shack. That was really cool because uh, we had the lobster traps and the buoys and things or whatever they're called that they use with the lobster traps. They're all different colors so that it gave us a chance to add bright colors to the piece. And uh, uh, I've done a couple other ones and I've done some... Uh, I call this my Patriot House. And uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, 
I think if you can see the um, the banner here, the freedom, freedom is never free. Um, the way the bark is broken up uh, gives it a nice rustic look that you you couldn't create anything that interesting. On this piece, ironically, I still remember this, this edge of this flag, if you can see the edge of the flag, that's the bark looked just like that. That was the edge of the bark. It just was, and so I just carved the rest of the bark away and created the flag. Uh, this particular one, um, I can talk about this more in a little bit. Uh, Rick Jensen in his books opens up a lot of his houses this way. It's a pretty easy way to do it. And on this particular one, I did it this way so that if you have it hanging on the wall, uh, you can see uh, some light through there, makes it a little more interesting. Um, so this is kind of what I do with my theme houses. Uh, I just have a couple of these here, I'll show you quick. And with, uh, with this big house here, to make it more interesting, I added a few beautiful looking young ladies uh, to go along with it. At least I thought they were pretty beautiful. Anyway, and they're out of bark. These are out of bark also. I left some bark showing so you could see that. I always try to leave a little bark showing. Um, I'll just talk about that real briefly here. On this particular piece, I have the tree coming up along the side and then coming across in front of the moon. And uh, part of that tree is the natural bark and part of that tree I carved. Not all pieces will lend themselves to that, um, but I bored y'all to death by now. Couple quick things. Um, in 2014, I did a real quick, simple uh, Halloween bark house for Wood Carving Illustrated. So if any of you have that issue, it's issue number 68. Uh, it's not rocket science or anything. It's pretty simple. Uh, you can look that up and, uh, and this was, uh, could, this picture here was the first cottonwood, the first theme house, the first Halloween house I did. And uh, I never wanted to get rid of that, but somebody wanted it more than I did one day at a show. So I got rid of it. Uh, so there, if you're interested. Now, um, on bark carving in general, I got too much junk laying around here. There's only one really good book uh, that I know of on bark carving, and this is uh, uh, Rick Jensen's book. It was done in 2004, and uh, I, I know a lot of it is pretty old. Um, uh, even Rick doesn't do a lot of these things exactly like this anymore, but it's still, I think, the best book out there on bark carving. I know uh, Rick was in the process planning to do a second book not too many years ago that I really wished uh, he would have done and that fell through. So as I know it, and somebody could correct me, but I think this is the best book out there on pork carving in general that'll teach you how to do the roofs, the windows, the siding, the rocks and all that. And uh, that's something I'm not gonna focus on at all today. Also, and I have asked, if any of you know Kathy Overcash, I've asked Kathy if it's all right if I use her information here or, or uh, 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 share it, I should say. Um, Kathy Overcash, if you don't know her, she's an outstanding bark carver. Uh, does a lot of really nice houses and, uh, and now she does uh, mostly faces and things in bark. And uh, so if you want to learn more about uh, the details of actually making a bark, uh, the, the, the bricks, the wind is the, that type of thing. Uh, Rick's book and Kathy Overcash on her website, she has this uh, information, which I've printed out for my own use. And 
If you go to artfromthebark.com, it's all one word, artfromthebark.com. You Google that or look that up and you will get to Kathy and her husband's, uh, Kathy and Dennis's website. And on that website, there's a link for, I think it's called instructional guides or something like that. And on there, you can find a lot of information, including uh, this little uh, instructional guide here. <clears throat> and one of the things I was going to talk about here just briefly, um, on all the bark houses, all the bark houses I have here, I have the old, if you will, traditional way of doing shingles are pretty straight. Uh, these are pretty time consuming, even to do them like this. Uh, I don't do them that way anymore, but now the way I do them, and Kathy has really good instructions here on doing the individual shingles. And uh, that seems to be the look that most people go for now. Uh, it really can take a long time to do, and uh, you can it, it just can be uh, kind of cumbersome which is why a lot of times I've just gone with a plain roof, uh, just a plain roof with a lot of motion in it. And that's, uh, but if you wanna learn how to do the individual shingles or the shingles in rows uh, between Rick's book and Kathy's, uh, you, uh, you will find a lot of information to keep you busy for a while. And I'll just show you this quick. It's not rocket science, but I'll, these were a few things that I used over the years for, uh, I used the witch and the bats uh, on the moon or in the background, if you will. And uh, I used these eyes, the spider, the cobweb and the cat in the windows. You can certainly, most of you are much more creative than I am, and you can find things and come up with things that are uh, better than this, but I'm just showing you some ideas. And this was uh, the Christmas ideas I had. That was a wreath I used over and over. And this was the Santa and the uh, reindeer that I used in the background on a couple of those that I showed you. Uh, this one here, that's the Santa and the reindeer. And that's just a sand I had on the roof. But uh, anyway, I just thought I'd show you that quick. Uh, anybody have any questions? Is anybody still there? <laughs> hey, Bob, can you give us that uh, number for your all's meeting again so I can post that in the chat? Sure. It's 417-966-2000. Uh, and what day is it? And it's uh, the first Tuesday of every month. This coming month, it'll be November 1st. It's at 7 o'clock Eastern time. You're all welcome to join. You can observe. You can participate. Uh, like I said before, we've had some uh, really interesting conversations already on there. Uh, different people from different parts of the country ask questions and there's always somebody on that has an answer or we get into a discussion. And uh, so everybody is welcome to join us. If you miss November 1st, just figure out when uh, the first Tuesday in December is. I don't have a calendar here, but whenever it is at seven o'clock Eastern time, we'll be on again. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Uh, just grab a couple things here quick. Um, when I'm uh, when I'm carving bark, I use uh, two gloves. I use one for my offhand, and I have an old leather glove here that's pretty well used. I've super glued it back together; it works real well. And I use that my other hand uh, because this, if I'm using my gouge or a V-tool, 
and you slip off, boy, this bark just tears up your uh, hands, something fierce. So I always rough out with two gloves. And um, I have three tools that I mostly use, I kind of dedicated them to my uh, roughing out on bark carving. And uh, I have a, uh, this is a 525. Uh, and I'm not really familiar with woodcarver supply tools, to be honest with you. I bought this at a, uh, oh, it says Lamprand, Germany. I, the one thing I can tell you is this is the hardest tool that I've ever owned as far as the steel. And uh, it really holds up well when I just tear into the bark. And uh, I also have a file tool that I've just sort of dedicated to this roughing out on the bark. And it's a number uh, 12. It's a pretty big 12. That might be, a, I'm not sure, out of 10, 12 or more. And then I have uh, two knives that I use. And I don't know a lot about these knives. Other, I mean, I don't know about their hardness or whatever, but I believe these are Cape Forge. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, they were made in New England, maybe Massachusetts. And I believe the, the man and his daughter who made these no longer make them. I think I'm right on that. And somebody out there uh, can certainly, I know there's somebody on the meeting that knows more about these than I do. But I can tell you, it's a heavier knife. It has no flex. It, it has a thick, it's thick in the back. And uh, this knife, I mean to tell you, you can really cut into the bark and uh, it just, it really holds up between, uh, between this gouge that I have and this, uh, this knife, uh, they just don't seem to lose their edge. And to be honest with you, and I hate to say this, we gotta have sharp tools, but in the case of roughing out this bark, these tools don't have to be the sharpest you've ever had. I mean, you're not looking for a clean edge on your, uh, on a, you know, a, a, a piece of basswood that you're carving. So they do get beat up. The outside of this bark, you know, this has been hanging on a tree somewhere out there in, um, oh, I don't know where, North Dakota or British Columbia or somewhere for a hundred or two hundred years, and. Uh, it's got all kinds of stuff. It's, it's tough. This outside layer is very tough. So it will tear up your tools. Don't, uh, don't use your nice, uh, oh, I'll just say it. Don't use your nice tools uh, for roughing out the bark. Uh, this bark, if you can see it, these layers, those very small microscopic layers are actually like growth rings on a tree. So if you were to count them, which would uh, I'll drive you crazy, but a piece like this could easily be 200 years old uh, without any trouble. Uh, another thing, uh, bark, uh, it, it carves easy when you get into the inside, some easier than others. I have actually, uh, I have gotten a couple pieces, more than a few, of cottonwood bark from various places that were almost like petrified. And they were so hard. And when I was a little younger, I just took my tools and I tore into it and just went at it. I don't do that anymore. I throw them out now. Uh, I, I just, it's just too hard on my hands. Uh, so uh, that's how I deal with that. Now, I'm gonna jump ahead here a little bit. And uh, this is a piece that I had roughed out a little in anticipation, anticipation of doing some work on it today. If you're gonna do much bark carving at all, you're gonna need some CA glue, thin. Always have thin and I have medium consistency and I have regular CA glue, the regular uh, super glue like you use. Uh, and then I have accelerator. And I should have debonder, but I'm out of it and I'll have to get some 
next weekend at the Conawaga Carving Show, I will get some from one of the vendors there. Uh, I don't, if something breaks off a piece of bark, generally, uh, you know, you're so used to when something breaks, you give it an, an oh shit or whatever you like to say. And then when you look at it and think about it, usually on bark, you didn't need it anyway. And you just redesign what you're doing or work around it. Sometimes like on this particular piece, you can see where I was, where I wanted to put a punk in here by the front door. This was really cracking off really bad. The whole front of this piece, you can see that. This bark is almost like compressed paper, really. And this was start. This this was all going to come off. So one evening when I finished up, I just took the uh, the thin CA and I ran it down in from the top. Left it run the whole way up in. Um, and then I hit it with the uh, uh, I forget what you call it activator, and it it dries it instantly. You will see steam, you'll see smoke coming out of your piece, big deal. Just don't breathe those fumes. They tell me, I never breathed any, so I don't know uh, how bad it is, but. Uh, and also, if you use the uh, CA glue, and I, I think you can buy this uh, at most hardware stores, I believe. And if nothing else, a lot of the wood carving supply places have it. I know, uh, Kling's Pour is the name of it, I believe, out of Hickory and a couple other places. They have shops in uh, North Carolina and they have a website and a, a, a catalog. Uh, you can get it from them, I know. If you get don't get any of the CA glue in your hand and then hit, hit the piece with the accelerator, because if you hit, if you have it on your hand and you hit hit the accelerator gets against your hand it is going to burn your hand like you won't believe and i know that because i did it twice you would think i'd be smart enough after i did it the first time i wouldn't let that happen again but i'm not that smart oh yeah here it is this is from uh cling's poor woodworking shop it says woodworkingshop.com so anyway uh this is something you're gonna need if you carve bark much at all. Like I said, I don't go around, if something break off, breaks off, I don't go around adding it back on and gluing it back on very seldom. But if I have a piece that's gonna, the whole thing is gonna break off, then I go ahead and I pre-glue it, if you will. And I carve right through that glue, right uh, as if it wasn't there. So that's something you're gonna need. Bob, does that glue show up at all when you put the finish on? Uh, no, that's a good question. Um, and as a matter of fact, no, because it would show up if you didn't carve it off, but I carve it off. That, that that's on the outside. I don't know if you can even see it, but there's a little glue right here at the peak of that roof. It's a little dark, it's a little wet looking. And uh, I had, I would carve right through that and just carve that off. So that, uh, and same thing with this pumpkin. I'm not sure I'm gonna keep that pumpkin on this piece actually, but if I do, uh, I will just carve right through that. And uh, no, you won't, the bark won't, the, uh, the glue won't show up because it's basically down inside the wood. See like all along here and all through here, all through here, into here, there's glue. Oh, here you can still see some. But now I will carve that off when I'm carving. So you won't see the glue when it's finished. I'm glad you, did that answer your question? Yes, thanks. My pleasure. And I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I wanted to talk just a little bit about how I finish my pieces. Um, and then I think I'll do a little carving if anybody's still awake. I paint with oils. 
I like oils uh, for a lot of reasons. They're more vibrant, they're brighter. And even on the bark houses, I like color. Uh, on this particular house, I maybe got a little more color than I had planned, <laughs> but uh, it, it's all right. I like, I like the brighter colors. I paint directly on the bark. I don't seal it, I don't do anything to it. I paint right on the bark. Um, and those of you that are a little familiar with uh, oil painting, you know that it does dry slower. But I will tell you this, on a bark like this, the bark is incredibly dry. And when I'm painting with my Memwax and my oil stains on this uh, bark, it dries so fast uh, compared to painting on basswood, for example. And I paint right on the basswood too. I don't seal it with anything. I, I seal it afterwards, but I'll, I'll paint this piece. I does the same way I do my animals or do anything. I paint right on the wood. And when it's dry, I spray it with uh, uh, satin deft. Uh, the, uh, I have that right here in one second. That's what I use. That's how I seal it. That's how I cover uh, the paint. And uh, that's all I do on everything I carve. It's pretty simple. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty simple too. So I like to keep it simple. So that's how I paint. Uh, some of you, I can see the light is not showing here this roof color very well. But if you wonder how I did that roof and how I got those shades, I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I took my Memwax, the, the, it would be like your water. It would be like my, my medium, my Memwax. And I soaked this whole thing first. Uh, this is like the end grain here, if you will. So if I hit this with paint right away, it's really gonna soak in. And I wanted this to be a little streaky. And so I hit, I soaked the whole thing with mem, plain Memwax. And then I took a little bit, it was a real dark blue I had. And I came back with a uh, blue on my paintbrush and I just hit it a few spots and then got more Memwax on and just washed it through and just kept washing it and washing it. And uh, that's how I got that look. I can see it's not coming out on the camera as well as I would like it to, but anyway. Um, and the moon, I always like to put a moon in. And the moon, I'll paint that with uh, my buff titanium. It's an off-white color I use. And then uh, I'll come around the edge with a yellow. And then I'll pull that yellow into the center so that it gradually fades in. And then I come back and I use a uh, iridescent silver, just a little bit. And I put that in the moon to give it just a little bit of a, just a hint of a gloss. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's what I do. That's how I do it. Any questions on that? Hey, Bob? Yes. When you say Minwax, what Minwax are you talking about, please? Okay, one second. I'll show you. Thank you. This is what I use as my medium for all my painting. It's my water, if you will. And it's, uh, they've changed the design on this can drastically in the last few years, but it's basically Mimwax Natural 209. They now have semi-transparent and all kinds of other stuff on here, but it used to just say Natural 209. And that's what I use. I put it in a little coffee cup, like you would put your water in a coffee cup or a coffee cup or a little cup. And I use the Memwax, like my water, like that's my medium that carries my paint. And uh, so that's what I use. That's how I paint everything. It's an old way of painting. I've been doing it about 20 years and I know people that have been doing it a lot longer than that, but uh, I think that was Ray. Did that answer your question, Ray? 
Yes, it did. Thank you very much, Bob. Okay. I don't recognize many people's voices, but I did yours. Because I hope, you used I hope to, that's a good thing. That is a very good thing. I you used to join us, and I hope you do again on our uh, Zoom meetings on the uh, first Tuesday of the month. And that's I how I recognize about the first Tuesday. What's that? I keep forgetting about the first Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know what it's like to be forgetful. I'm getting better at that all the time myself. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I wanted to show you or tell you about uh, my bark carving in general. Uh, Bob, where do you get your uh, your bark? Oh boy. <laughs> um, well, that's a loaded question. I, I, I have, I used to have a really good supplier uh, in British Columbia, and I, I used to buy bark by the uh, uh, 50 to 75 pounds at a time. And uh, anyway, he fell off the face of the earth and I don't have him anymore. And uh, uh, anyway, I always tell people, if you find bark and you want to carve bark and you find some nice bark, buy lots of it. Um, I, it seems like a lot of the people that used to sell bark uh, aren't out there anymore. And I know there's some new people. If you go, there's a, 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 a Facebook page called Bark, Cottonwood Bark Lovers, I believe. If you go on there, there's several people on there that sell bark. I believe the one fellow's in Missouri and there's a lady in Alaska sells bark. Um, I know at our recent CCA event, uh, Randy Moore from, uh, oh, I believe he's from North Dakota. He had some really nice cottonwood bark there. And I assume it probably was harvested in North Dakota, I would guess, because they have a lot of nice bark in North Dakota. I used to buy bark from Rick Jensen. He doesn't, as far as I know, sell it anymore. Uh, so the best I could tell you is Randy Moore might have some. I know Chipping Away sells it uh, some, uh, but I believe if I was looking to buy bark, and and to make a long story short, I have enough bark here at the house now to last me, last me the rest of my life, I'm pretty sure. Um, especially no more bark carving than I've been doing lately. But uh, if I was to look for bark today, I believe I would go to the uh, Facebook page, Cottonwood Bark Lovers. I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. If it's not, maybe somebody can correct me. And uh, there's a couple people in there selling it. Or I would try, I know Randy Moore had really nice bark. And, uh, you know, and the thing about bark, it's like buying basswood out of Wisconsin or any of this stuff, the uh, the bark, it's usually sold by the pound. It, I used to pay four or five dollars a pound and it would cost that much then to ship it. I don't know what they're getting for it now, probably a little more than that, maybe a lot more. Um, but with bark, just like buying basswood, if you get good stuff and you have it shipped, the, uh, the shipping is probably gonna uh, be as much as the cottonwood bark itself. Um, I'm sorry I don't have a better answer than that, but that's the best I can do. Um, so. Okay, I'm going to carve a little bit. Um, if there are any other questions, I'll field them or just as we go. Uh, I don't have enough time to do a whole bark house, but I would just show you a little bit what I do and I'll jump ahead here and uh, We'll carve just a little bit so you can see uh, what I'm doing. Uh, the first thing I do, and I've already done it with this piece, uh, on the back, as a matter of fact, you can see I paid $10 for this. And I, this is a piece that I bought from Randy Moore in uh, Colorado Springs a month ago. And so uh, that's a nice piece of wood for $10. That's, that's a really reasonable price there, I'll tell you that. Uh, I just happened to see it was on there. On the back of the of the bark, uh, you're going to have this layer of uh, that. I, I believe that layer is called the uh, cambrium. Uh, I think it's kind of between the bark and the tree. It's a living uh, part. And the first thing I do 
and I won't bore you with the whole thing, but I take my gouge and I clean the back of that off. And this is really dirty. Uh, when you're roughing out a piece of cottonwood bark, it's really dirty. So uh, if I'm once in a while gonna carve a piece of cottonwood bark, say at our wood carving cl uh, club on a Thursday carve when we get together, I'll do this dirty work at home. Uh, and I'll just get rid of that and jump ahead. But that's what I do first. I clean the back off because I want to know where the, back, the back's going to be. Because uh, as you can see, when I'm finishing my piece, that's going to be pretty thin. And so I want to make sure I have a nice clean back. And that's how I get them started, all of them. Uh, this particular piece here that I worked on a little bit, I thought I could carve on it today some. Uh, it had a unique uh, big dish in the back there, if you can see that, which will be no problem because that's going to be in, inside the house here. But uh, anyway, that's why I cleaned the back off first, which I've already done to this piece. And I'm just going to really very quickly start uh, start one here. Uh, if I, uh, the other day, just preparing this piece, I cleaned the back off. And typically when you buy a piece of bark, they have it cut flat. I don't want this to be flat. I don't want it to be set standing straight up. I want it to be angled a little. So I took it on my belt sander and uh, just, uh, uh, just angled a little bit. So it won't, I'd have a hard time showing you that here, but it won't be setting, standing straight up. It'll have a little lean to it. And this particular piece, uh, I'll start it just a little here today, but uh, when I finish this up, it'll uh, be relatively similar to something like this. Uh, I'll try to make it a little nicer. I did that one 10 years ago. Hey, and uh, yes. When you're doing roof lines and stuff like that, do you angle it like a vanishing point to uh, add in depth perception? I, I may I not be asking that question right. No, you're asking the question right, and that's been asked often. I don't really do that so much, uh, but as you can see on this roof line, uh, using this for an example, this one I have faded, uh, not to create the vanishing point, just to create interest, because I don't want it to be straight. I want it to be, uh, you could look straight down at it. It has motion in it, and if you look on the side, it has motion. So no, I don't uh, do like a perspective, if you will, uh, like you would on a true relief carving. Uh, this, is, this is sort of a carving in the round on the front, and then you have a little bit of a relief carving in the back is sort of what it is. But uh, no, that was a good question. And I, I don't do uh, that. Uh, uh, Just for everybody's info, my wife looked up and says eBay carries a lot of bark. I don't know the quality, oh. but it is on eBay. Okay, I wouldn't know anything about that. Um, I, you know, <laughs> my wife loves research and stuff. Okay, well that's good. Keep her on the ball. Keep her busy. Um, she does that to me. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm sure that I guess they sell everything else on eBay. So why wouldn't they sell bark? So I'm just going to get the roof line started here a little. Uh, this would be the top of the roof. I'm just going to have one roof on this one. And just start pushing it in. I won't get too far with this today. And then I'm going to jump ahead to the other one a little bit. Um, I don't think I have one of them here. I have done some really small little bark houses and I maybe should have done one of them today because I could just about uh, do one of them. Of course, I don't have that much time no, I would. So I'm just getting the roof line started here a little, just show you how we start. And I used to think this bark really carved easy. And I've noticed that in the last 10 years, the bark has got a lot harder. 
or something happened in the last 10 years. And what I'm going to do on this, and I, uh, I'll show you on the, the one that I jumped ahead with here a little, but I want to keep the roof, uh, the edge of the roof, to, when I'm roughing this out, real heavy. Uh, because then there's two things I can do. I can move the roof up or down. This can be the top of the roof or this can be the bottom. And I can move it up or down in that space. And I can also put a lot of motion into the roof uh, like I've done in this one. And so at this point, I just want a really wide roof line as I'm getting this roughed in. Hey, Bob, I just had a question in the chat. I, um, somebody's just wondering if you make bark houses um, for any Philadelphia Phillies uh, players that are out of work. <laughs> uh, it sounds like we're hearing from Arizona here to me. It may have been somewhere on the West Coast. I'm not sure. Yeah, it sounds like somebody out in Arizona is not keeping busy enough. <laughs> I am making no comments about the Philadelphia Phillies. Yeah, well, uh, well, no comments. If I was going to make a comment, well, I won't. <laughs> You're trying to get me in trouble, Blake. Just trying to get you to laugh, Bob. <laughs> well, I'm still laughing, but with our pitching tonight, I'm not so sure I'm going to be laughing too long. Could get ugly quick. And I'm just creating the whole front of the house here. And here again, I'm not sure which direction, but it's gonna lean one way or the other. Looks like it's going to lean off in this direction. So I'll carve it that way. I'll bring this roof. And this particular house, a couple of them there, you saw that I had a tree coming up the side and, and across in front of the moon, like this one. I won't be doing that on this house because there's nothing here on the side, either side, that lends itself to uh, a tree. Uh, I could force one in if I wanted to, but I don't particularly want to. And I do use a lot of backhand for this roughing in. I should know, I used to know. Uh, this is a really nice, I'm not sure if this is Dakota wood or what, but it's a really nice red color to it. If you can see that. I know sometimes you get, uh, bark out of North Dakota that's almost golden. And maybe I know, for all I know, Randy gets his wood uh, somewhere else. Maybe he doesn't get it out of North Dakota. there we're going to knock that off a while i kept this roof line eh, really wide wider than i usually do 
just trying to prove my point or show my point. You can see how dirty this is. Now we'll push this whole bottom in here and that'll give us a lot more width at the bottom for the door. And because this is an air piece, the front of the house won't be as wide as I would probably like. So, uh, we will just, there's nothing saying that the front of the house has to be flat. So to make the front wider, I'm going to angle it off to the side here. See how we're getting more width on the front already? I can push this. I'm going to jump ahead real soon to the other one because I realize this is not very exciting watching me rough this piece out. That's sort of the start of the house. Uh, now, I'll move, get more off of here. This isn't the easiest piece of bark I ever carved. It's fairly hard. Either that or I'm really getting old. Now, I will start to think about this house is going to lean off in this direction. I've exaggerated here so you can see it's going to be leaning in this direction. So I'm going to bring the chimney off of this side, bring it around onto the top of the roof a little bit so that it'll have the piece will have a flow like a lazy sea, sort of. Uh, I need to go a lot deeper before I even start thinking about the chimney. And although this is a pretty uh, ragged looking old haphazard house, you gotta make sure that you have your chimney back uh, on top of the house. It's pretty easy to get your uh, house pushed back too far that you don't have room for your chimney. You don't want it hanging out over the roof, over the house. I hope some of you give a Halloween house a try. Um, it, it, like I said, get yourself a piece of bark. It's not the, it's not a precious commodity, and uh, and have at it. Have a little fun with it. As they say, don't be afraid to make a mistake. It's just practice. Oh, let's see. I'm going to carve on this a few minutes. Hey, yes. 
I've noticed I've noticed uh, some on some other demos, uh, cottonwood bark people mount them on a board um, instead of holding them in their hands. Is is there is that just your personal preference or? It's my personal is preference. That, I looked at Kathy over. She didn't show it mounted. So. Yeah, um, a lot of times when they're doing that, they're carving a face. And, okay. Uh, and they're. Uh, you know, they're working with uh, two hands on their tool like this, or they're working with a mallet. Uh, and uh, so I can, I've never done that, but uh, if I was doing uh, something uh, like that, a face uh, like uh, a lot of the people do, I could see the advantage of doing that. Uh, but in my case, I'm kind of working on something in the round. So I'm gonna be turning it and, uh, you know, working from different angles. Uh, I, you could do that by mounting it solid, uh, but uh, uh, for me, I just never really, uh, never gave it a thought or never found it uh, necessary, I guess you might say. I don't see a reason you couldn't do it. You know, that all comes under the heading of whatever works. And it, it sure would work. You could certainly make a house like this, uh, a haunted house. Um, well, you've inspired me. I'm, I want to try it now. I I was too lazy to build the mounting bracket and all that other stuff. So <laughs> if I could just get my hands on a piece of cottonwood, I think I'll whack away at it. <laughs> And who is this, may I ask? This is Norm. Oh, hi. Down in North Carolina. Oh. Well, hey, if you need inspiration on how to do things a lazy way, you came to the right place here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because Ron Daddy doesn't let me put up with any of that. Uh-huh. I'm sure he doesn't. <laughs> That's right. Well, don't tell Ron you were carving bark and just carve away and have fun with it. And then when you're all done, show it to you. Uh, so anyway, uh, I don't want to bore you completely to death, but we're starting to get a look roughly of a house here, which I intend to make nicer than this one here. Uh, I don't hardly see how I could make it worse, but this was an old one. I did this one uh, 10 years ago. So anyway, uh, I'm going to stop with this, but you get Bark the idea. Bark was softer back then. What's that? Bark was softer back then. It was. You know, basswood was softer back then, too. All this wood was, butternut was softer back then 10 years ago. Not sure what happened to the wood. Um, and while I think of that, uh, just one thing, some of you that know me know that I occasionally use uh, the 50% uh, water and alcohol on uh, butternut or basswood. And occasionally, <clears throat> if the situation uh, is such, uh, I've tried that on bark and it does not work at all. The bark, if you think of it more as a compressed paper, uh, when you spray it on the bark, it doesn't soak in at all like it does on other wood. And then the layer or two that it soaks in, it just makes it like, um, oh, almost like paper. It just like makes it like crumbly, like just, oh, it just doesn't work, uh, I've found. Uh, because I tried it on a couple of those petrified pieces that I had had then. Uh, uh, anyway, as I go along here, I would start to develop the uh, the chimney back in here. Can bring it across like that, something like that. I would have the chimney, and then I that would leave me, and then I have to push all this wood here back to the back and that'll leave me a lot of nice room to put a big moon on there 
maybe have a witch flying through it or have some bats on it or something like that. And uh, by keeping this wide roof line, I can, I can move this around. I can move it down. I can move it up. I can move a lot of twist into it. Uh, so I just thought I'd show you how I get one started a little bit. Um, I don't want to bore you completely to death. Uh, this is one I have a lot further along. I was working on just this week. And it has some similarities to this other piece. It's not going to be as big. I'm not going to try to make it as gory. Uh, I'm going to put a front door on this, uh, hidden partially by the pumpkin. If I keep the pumpkin, I'm not going to put the coffin door on. And uh, so uh, I thought uh, I might just carve on this one a little bit. I'm not sure if you can quite see, but <coughs> excuse me. And I want to just point one thing out here on the uh, when you start to separate out the chimney. I use a VTool. I use my 16.6 VTool, which is a 45 degree. But you want to work it back and forth. I'll work it one side, then the other side. Work it back and forth. And you always have to give the, the bark somewhere to go as you're cutting it. You can't just take a big VTool or a big knife or anything in here and force it in uh, as you're starting this. Uh, because if you do, this chimney is just like these layers of compressed paper, if you will, think of it that way. And if you wedge that in there, you wedge a big old tool in there, it's just gonna bust that chimney right off. So you can use a gouge, you can use a flat gouge, you can use a knife even, but by using this V tool or a small number 11, you can get underneath and work with the grain here, if you will. It's not really grain, but you can work with the right way. And you can get this out and clean this out. And uh, just make sure that you're not forcing tools in uh, anywhere on bark because it will bust out. You have to kind of sneak up on, uh, on it sometimes and uh, just chip away a little. Uh, you can see I've left the uh, the back uh, real heavy because uh, I'm going to put uh, a couple of tree limbs somewhere here. I'll have a big old noon. And uh, then I'm going to have some tree limbs coming off of this side behind the chimney out across the moon. So I need some depth here to create my tree limbs. But this back will be very thin when I'm done. Um, and I was just going to carve away a little here. Uh, I'm going to separate. I better take this. I'm going to take that glove off and just tape my finger here quick, folks. Just a little bit. Okay. Now I'm going to separate this uh, chimney from the roof line and I'll take uh, my 16.6 uh, in here to do that. And here again, I'm not just forcing it in here. I'm working with the right edge of the V tool. Now I'm going to come back and use the left edge. Now the right edge and then the left edge. That way it always has somewhere to go. If you just force this thing right in there, that big hunk of steel, you can make one big gigantic cut and force that in there, but it is going to bust out. I will guarantee you. I hope you can see how. I'm... If you can see, I'm separating the chimney from the roof line. Maybe if I, I guess it's hard. I'm looking at it on my camera here and it's hard to see because the bark is uh, see now I'm carving 
off the side of the chimney. Now I'm carving off the side of the roof. Now I'm gonna carve off the side of the chimney. Now the side of the roof. I'm switching the sides of the vehicle that I'm using. And there, I'm starting to create some space. Now, I need to follow this roof line up in the back here. Now, one of the things I wanted to do here, uh, I want to push this roof down and back deeper so that I'll have more room to have the moon showing here. And that's pretty easy to do. I'm just gonna use this, uh, it's a uh, number eight, 12. Now I'm using uh, some of my regular tools that I use uh, to carve uh, caricatures right now. And uh, what I do when I'm down in this finer work, when I'm not cutting in the ugly outside of the bark, I'll use my regular tools. I don't really use my good varsity knives, if you will, but I use my regular tools and uh, I will put this aside when I'm done and I won't put it back in my toolbox, my carrier here, until I have it sharpened. So uh, if I go to pick this thing out next time and I'm carving a Christmas tree ornament, uh, I want uh, I want to resharpen it before I go back to that. Now I'm going to take this roof back past even, if that makes sense, because I'll create even more space on my background for moon and witch and bats and tree limbs. Same with this gouge, it's one of my regular gouges and it doesn't really ruin it or booger it up real bad, but it won't give, you work with it on bark for a little while and it won't uh, have that nice shine uh, next time you cut into your uh, basswood. So I'll just take it back here on the brick sharpener and buff it up a little, hone it up a little quick and uh, Now, I hope you can see how I'm starting to create movement in this roof and also adding more space on my background here to uh, do whatever it is I decide to do back there. Um, I'll just continue this while I'm doing it. I, uh, I'll just, you can see I've, uh, I still have a heavy roof line here but we want to start to thin that out a little. So I'm using my 16.3, my favorite handy dandy little tool here. And here again, I'm using the right side chisel to cut underneath that roof. I'm not just forcing it in here. I'm not just taking a big stab and forcing it in. I'm using the one side of the V tool. If I don't do that, at this point here, if you just take that little V tool and ram it in there, uh, it's gonna bust this roof off for certain. And if it does bust off, I will just forget it. I'll, too bad. We just will live without that part of the roof. But I'm gonna try not to break it off. Uh, that's the plan. Thin in this edge. I'm going to have a post here. So I'll be taking this, uh, I'll be carving this through, but I'm not going to bother with you doing that today. So uh, still get more movement in that roof. See how I'm getting movement in this roof line? 
almost anything but straight. And fortunately, fortunately for me, or unfortunately, I literally can't see straight lines. So um, cutting all these crooked angled things is just right for me, I guess you might say. Now, on this one here, I'm going to push this roof line down from the top. Thin that out. And I think on this piece, I probably will uh, just do a plain flat thatched roof, if you will. Uh, sometimes I've even taken, uh, if I'm going to have a plain roof like this, uh, on my little micro grinder, I have a little brass wheel and I put that on and uh, uh, just roughed it up in the direction of the, uh, the wood grain, if you will. Uh, to give it a, a texture. See, we're having that roof. See how we're getting some real interesting roof line there. We'll do the same down here too. I don't think I will get to that today. Oh no, I definitely won't get to that today. Uh, one more thing I do want to show you though. Um, and I can... I'll use a real big drake gouge here. I have, I believe this is a 5 8 inch. It's almost a U or almost a number 11. It is a U. And on this roof, we can really get some interesting things going. We can really get an old raggedy looking roof going there. You don't want to take it down everywhere because then you will have taken it down nowhere. You won't have any shadow or any uh, create any interest, but uh, Hope you can see where I've added a lot of depth to the roof. Let's see if you can see that. Not sure if you can. And I'll work this uh, quite a while till I get it to suit me. I can. Uh, underneath there. I can take more off the top here. Get that real thin. There, see how we're getting a really nice movement in that roof line. And the bottom one, I'm going to do the roof going the other way. And this bottom shed, if you will, or bottom floor is going to be angled off this way and the top one's going to be going off the other way. Just to make it interesting. Um, this part down here will be part of the tree root. And I can see from the front, I can't see much of my tree root. So I will uh, have to push the side of the house in some more as I'm finishing this up so that I have more of the tree root exposed. Not root, not the root, the bottom of the tree, if you will. Uh, I hope I made this simple enough that uh, some of you will try it. It's, uh, it's really, uh, I think they're fun. And uh, so, uh, and the chimney, I can put bricks on that. I can put uh, uh, stones on it. Uh, I can, or I can let it bare. Just put a cap on it. Here I put put stones on it. Uh, some of them I put bricks on. 
those things take a lot of time extra. And uh, if you just leave it bare, put a cap on it uh, and leave it natural, uh, here I'll have a little bark exposed on the side of the chimney. Um, it'll look just fine. You don't have to get all hung up on doing all the details of, uh, uh, I mean, you can if you want to, but you don't have to do all the little, uh, uh, lost my tool there. You don't have to do all the little, uh, the roof shingles and the bricks and uh, that kind of stuff really can take a lot of time and sometimes doesn't even add anything to your piece. Now you can see right here, the edge of that roof is getting pretty shaky. So even though I'd like to take a little more off of it, yeah, I think I better stop there. Underneath the roof here, I'm going to use my 16.3 and go up underneath that to create a nice shadow under there. There again, the edge of that roof isn't going to be straight. You can see that we're getting depth there. I don't know if anybody's still awake or not. I doubt it. Yeah, you're good, Bob. Okay. <laughs> and we're, uh, we're at about 25 after four on the East Coast. I uh, just want to open it up and uh, see if anybody has any questions for Bob at this time. I uh, want to remind you, too, that we still have the auction going for the uh, autographed Bob Hershey Signature Series Helvy Knife. Uh, if you're interested in bidding on that, uh, go ahead and do that in the chat now. Bob, I did want to ask, do you have a specific brand of the uh, oil paint that you use? I don't. Uh, if I were to get my oil paints out, I'd probably have... Uh, Oh, I have a variety. Uh, I, when I started, I, I, I bought Old Holland. Old Holland are probably the best you can buy. Uh, and as, it, uh, as luck would have it, they're the most expensive. But they have a, uh, the, they have a color fast factor, which is uh, the color will last how long the color will last uh, for like hundreds of years. And at some point I decided that it didn't matter to me if the color of my carvings uh, was uh, going to last 300 years or not, because, it, you know, <laughs> so I buy anything. I buy a lot of, uh, I go to uh, Michael's and uh, uh, blickart.com and I go to um, Hobby Lobby and uh, any uh, oil paint, uh, if it's color, I wanna get it. And if it's not a mix, uh, I mix colors. I use some right out of the tube, and I mix some. But no, I I'd say buy I'd say buy cheap ones. To be honest with you, uh, okay. and, and I have a lot of different ones. And over the years, several people have tried oil painting and went uh, some friends of mine and went all in and bought a lot of oil paints. And uh, about two years later, they come to me and they go, oh, here, have these. And I go, well, how much you want for them? Yeah, just get rid of them. I don't want to see them ever again. Right. So I have a, I'll bet you I have 50 tubes of paint just from that way alone. And nice. I use them, whatever they are, I use them. Okay. So. Well, it doesn't look as though we have any more uh, questions in the chat. So Bob, I want to say thank you for taking time out to come in and present with us and uh, go Phillies. I know you're going to be watching the game tonight. So <laughs> since your Phillies beat my brains, I guess I'm going to be watching the Phillies and rooting those guys on. Um, we'll go ahead and end the chat or in the uh, bid for the auction also. Uh, so if, um, let's see who won here. If Paula will stay in the room at the end of the meeting, we'll uh, get your information. Paula, thank you for the support. Uh, we really appreciate it. And again, the proceeds will go towards continuing these, uh, these meetings. So I wanna thank you for that. I wanna let you all know that uh, coming up uh, next weekend, we've got Rod Gatlin that's gonna be coming in, joining us. He's gonna be presenting for us. Uh, he's from the Charlotte Woodcar Woodcarver Show. 
Um, I visit that show every year, and he's going to talk a little bit about his carving journey, tell us about that show uh, and how you can get involved down there. Uh, in November so far, we've got uh, Jim Feather uh, from the same club that Bob Hershey's from. Jim's going to come on and do a presentation for us on November the 12th. Uh, Jim's been on with us a couple times in the past. His uh, presentations are always, always great, and uh, it, they've been real popular in the past, so we we'll look forward to having Jim on again. Uh, and then Ryan Olson is going to be coming on in November on the 19th. Uh, he's got that class coming up, and he's also going to uh, be doing a demonstration for us on November the 19th. I did put in the chat that we're looking for presenters, so if anybody wants to present with us, uh, please reach out to me so we can go ahead and get you on the calendar. Uh, we're booking now through uh, November and December, so uh, if there's anybody that would like to come on, talk about their carving journey, uh, present any kind of wood carving with us, uh, reach out to me and let me know so that we can get you on the list. Uh, again, Bob, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, thank you all for joining us on this Saturday afternoon, and we look forward to seeing you all next Saturday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, Paul, if you'll stay on, uh, we'll get your information. I thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Perfect. And I smiled. Yes. Four. Love it.